Okay. Hello, everyone. Welcome to a episode, our first one, of a Getting Real series where we're just going to go a little bit deeper. And today I have Michael Thorne, and it is a honor. Michael is a 20-year industry veteran, probably more. 30. Well, 30. 29. 30, 30 next summer. Uh, he, he's been one of Inman News' uh, 100 most influential people. He's known throughout uh, North America. Uh, very, just an amazing guy. Has a wonderful business. But most of all, why he's here, he's just a good human. So I, I just want to go deep with Michael. Just listen in awe. And, and just to set the stage, we're entering this uh, new season, a normalization of the real estate market. And it seems that we're entering a year where there's likely going to be significant uh, transaction velocity reductions. I've seen anywhere uh, on reports of Goldman Sachs saying the the U.S. may be in the 4.3 million range down from 6 million. So so that is a a shift. And a, a market shift doesn't necessarily mean that you can't have your best year ever. And you being in, the, in this for 29 years, you've been through these seasons. You've been through recessions and market shifts. How have you fared? Well, that's a great question. Uh, in 2009, which was the, the biggest of the little dips that we've had over the years, um, up until that point, to 2009 was our best year we'd had um, up until that point. And, and going into 2008, the fall of 2008 and obviously up here in Canada, we, we didn't get hit as hard um, as, as it was South of the border, but there was an agent in my uh, office who, who was very excited about 2009 and he was a very seasoned veteran. He had gone through 81 and 82. And um, I, I pulled him aside and I said, why are you so optimistic? And he says, because new opportunities are going to present themselves. And, the office generally, and I think the industry right now is, oh, this is not good times, but it's opportunities. And 2009 was our best year up until that point because we were able to identify opportunities that presented themselves in 2008 and 2009 that hadn't presented themselves in, a, in, in quite some time. And if you're able to identify those opportunities, and in that case, it was buyers, and I think we're probably moving towards buyers right now. Uh, the opportunity was for first time home buyers to get into the market because we knew that the swing would come back. You know, housing demands are going to come back. Populations going to grow. Um, and then if you can identify the opportunity, it is then your job to articulate that opportunity to the general public in a, a mass way, if that's video or whatnot. And then also one-on-one to, to reach out to the people that you know in your sphere or kids of past clients and say, here's an opportunity. Um, And then help them guide those people through that, through that process. And I think we're right there right now. I think buyers have been on the sidelines generally for the past seven years on couches for the last two and a half years as the market ran away from them. And now they're being presented with an opportunity um, that hasn't presented itself for quite some time. It is our job as agents to guide these buyers through the process so that they can win long-term. And, and there are a lot of people that had fundamentally changed their future when they got into the market in 2009. Um, and then we saw the rebound and it will come back. I always go back when I talk to people, my grandfather paid $9,000 for his first home. My mom and dad to 27,500. Myself, 163500 My son, who's 16, will buy an apartment for $700,000, $800,000. That's the way it will go. Um, and, and, and so we need to, to identify and then articulate to, to the right audience. It's interesting uh, what I'm picking up on a, just a, a current underneath the surface is when seasons like this come, how you're going to do so much of it depends on your mindset because you're labeling this as opportunity mm-hmm. where a lot of people in our industry, they can just get real tactical, which is more fear-based reaction. But you're approaching us with a completely different idea and, and it's positive. 
and it's just not the real estate market. It's anything. It's the early adoption on a lot of technology that our team has had where, where agents see change, we see opportunity. That's just, that's just the way it is. And unfortunately, a lot of our industry, and I think a lot of people in general, will change to keep up. So they still make the change so that they don't fall behind, but they never get opportunity. The opportunity was taken by the people that changed early or, or adopted early or articulated opportunity early. That's, who, that's where the opportunity, opportunity is limited when change comes along. And then when the last people make the change, it's so that they don't get left behind, but they never ever win for their change, but they still had to change. And so we've been paperless since the early 2000s. And that has made our customer experience great over the past two decades. There's a lot of people that during COVID adopted a paperless way of doing business so that they could stay in business. Not so they could win business, so they could stay in business. But they still had to do the same change we made. We just made it early. And that's the same thing that will happen now. People right. will be able to articulate and educate. That's a big part of it. That's a thing that our industry doesn't love to do, and I don't know why. Educate transparently to, our, to the public so they know every ins and outs, so that they are, they are wise, and then they can make the change. And I believe this about education and I know we, we, we talked before it and I can ramble on. I think a highly educated buyer and seller who knows everything that can go right and everything that can go wrong in a transaction, a highly educated consumer is then more likely to use an agent than not use an agent. So the fear of educating the consumer shouldn't be there, but we have this fear. Then when you have a highly educated consumer that is more likely to use an agent, I think a highly educated consumer that will use an agent is better able to identify the difference between a good agent and a great agent. Right. So a highly educated public benefits great agents more than anyone else. Yet we have in our industry, this fear of what happens if the public knows as much as we do about the transaction. We do this hundreds of times a year. Our job is not to our job is to guide people through the process, not, not to keep them in secret, not to keep them in the dark, but to guide them through the process, to say, hey, this, this, this obstacle is about to present itself, this opportunity is about to present itself, but having an educated consumer is not a problem. Right. Uh, you're bringing up something that I didn't plan on, on bringing up. Um, I've read statistics by NAR uh, upwards of, I think, 75 to 85% of home buyers and sellers when interviewed post-transaction, they would use that agent again. They had a good relationship yeah. with them. They were happy with the experience. Yet our industry seems to get a black eye at times. And you said something so important about uh, we need to be deliberate about being kinder to one another. And I'd love to hear your ideas on that because that's coming from a lot of wisdom. You, you mean between agents? between agents. Yeah. yeah. It's it, like, I, I have this question, a uh, little rapid fire around at the end of our, uh, my, my podcast. Uh, and question number like six is a 30,000 foot view. If there's one thing you could change about the real estate industry, what would you change? And we get all these different answers. And before, while I was writing out the questions for the rapid fire round, I was like, what, how would I answer it? And, and this is how it, I wish we were publicly able to, to praise each other more to the public. Yeah, to the public. If, I wish we were able to say great things about each other publicly because when realtors say things publicly about other realtors, usually it's a negative thing that we're saying. It's, it's a bitter point. We don't, we don't mind saying something bad about another realtor because th then if the public knows that that realtor is not that great of a realtor, they're more likely to use me. But what we don't do is we don't set, stand on a soapbox in the middle of our hometown and say, she's awesome to work with. He's super professional. His marketing is incredible. He's super ethical. Like we, can't, we don't praise the people in our industry that we love working with because we fear that it means that someone who might have used us will go use them because I've endorsed that particular person. But we all know those agents that we work with 
when we get an offer coming in and we see the name at the top of the sheet, we go, oh, this is going to go well. I can't right. wait to work with her or, right. or do a deal with him. And, and, and that's the one thing I wish we could do. Now, I can praise realtors in Denver and in Toronto and Winnipeg all day long because I don't have that fear. But the people hearing me praise them aren't in Winnipeg, aren't in Toronto, aren't in Denver. So it really doesn't impact the industry the same way. I just wish we could say how awesome we are because I believe this in our industry, real estate agents are some of the best human beings and they have this amazing intention and they're empathetic and they care about their clients and they're amazing, but we just don't say that enough. Right. Uh, you brought up an important word on why we don't do that. And that's, that is fear. Yeah. Uh, and fear can expand, especially when we are, for a lot of people unknown, they've never had a market that wasn't ideal. So um, I have, you know, I, I read a lot just about how to get better at life. And I'm a big believer that if you get the day right, the ingredients of every day, the weeks, months, years take care of themselves. How do you approach your days? Um, we were talking about this, about my, my excitement sometimes now as I'm getting older to, to go to bed because I get to wake up and have a coffee in the morning. So uh, I try to get up uh, earlier than the rest of the family, um, especially during school, school times. My, my wife, my amazing wife is, is a teacher and two kids in high school now. Oh, my goodness. And I try to have 15 minutes of silence with a cup of coffee. Um, I love being quiet. I, I think that's really, really important to be quiet. Uh, then I get the kids off to school. My, my wife goes off to work. Uh, and then I get out for a walk with the dog. And that's probably my most creative time. That's where ideas come up. Um, I try to embrace boredom or silence as much as I possibly can. I think that's really, really important. So I try to get out there. Um, I might listen to a podcast if there's something I really want to listen to, but if not, I try to be quiet um, and 45 minute walk, walk with a dog um, and then off to the office where we spend uh, from 10 till noon with a team. Uh, and then we, we look at the day and then we go from there. That's, that is, a, that is amazing. So, so refreshing just to get that slow start uh, rather than just get thrown into busyness all day where, where really we get lost. And my thesis is we have such a distorted view of what success is mm. in, in this industry that it, it clutters our minds. It distracts us from really what is important. And the reality is everyone has their own definition of, of success. What yeah. is happiness and, and meaningful to one person is going to be different to another. Uh, why are we there? How do we fix it? What, what is success? Yeah, I'm a big part of this. I talk about this as much as I possibly can. If, if someone were to say, you know, I want you to write a, and I've been blessed to go all over North America and Europe and speak on stages. If, if I were to build a new keynote out and, and want to really tour it around, it would be on this topic. Unfortunately, and I don't really blame the industry, but it's unfortunate that we have one you know, matrix for, for success in our industry. And it's been that way since the early nineties. And I don't see it changing anytime soon. And it's, it's money. I mean, that's, that's how we judge success. That's where the, 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 the awards come from. That's it's the deals closed money's made. Here's your big trophy. That's what success is. And there are so many amazing agents that are, are providing a great, income and raising a great family, saving up for college, donating their time at, at uh, charities, being at every baseball game for their kid, being at every dance recital. And they're making $140,000 a year. And I think they are enormously successful human beings. I, I just think they're really, really successful. I've got a number of awards. Our team's got a number of awards. But the awards that I cherish the most are the service awards that I've gotten. The, the awards for recognition or giving back to my brokerage or giving back to the industry or education awards. Those sort of things mean way more to me than, than the dollar volumes. 
And so what we have to do as individual people, in my opinion, is define what what your success is. And that really comes back to like, why are you doing this? Like, like even if it wasn't this real estate, if it was something else, what would make you a successful human being? And once you figure out what your definition of success is, then your job is to pursue that with like reckless abandonment, go after whatever that success is. And I'm right in the middle, you know, I've got a 16 year old kid that's thinking about architecture and all these things. And you know, he sees people with nice sneakers and that sort of stuff. And I said, Carter, $350,000 a year in miserable or $100,000 a year in happy. If every day you go out to work and you make $100,000 a year and it's something you love to do and you're a happy human being, you're far more successful than somebody right. else who's making three fifty. dollars You just, it is. And so my definition of success, because I've learned it the hard way going through, um, about three years of a very bad depression after a car accident is success for me is the number number of hours in a day that I'm happy. That's it. I love that because nothing else matters Uh, to me. It's happiness. And sometimes when we get into this industry and we're working with a client that's super frustrating, who doesn't value our value. Like if, 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 if someone doesn't see the value you provide, walk away from that client, like walk away from that client because you could be spending it with someone else or you could be at home with your kid throwing the football or you could be reading a book, like be happy. Um, And, and, you know, it's taken some time to get there, but we do need to start to define our own happiness. And I think brokerages have gotten very good at this. My brokerage for sure is trying to identify what success is for each agent and pushing them towards that. So if they know that that their agent is, I want to close, you know, 150 deals a year, they'll really help push that client to that goal. If another agent's goal is this, this balance, you know, they, 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 they love when they come into the office at noon because they went out and they, they went out early morning round of golf and they really praise that person for, Hey, great job. Hey, do you enjoy the round? That's, you know, to reinforce that, that's a great brokerage and cultures become much more important in our industry. But yeah, I think, I think people have got success all wrong. And I don't know what the industry can do about it because I don't know how you gauge rewarding charity work and success and client care. Like if, if you're, if you, if you work with eight people a year and close eight deals and your clients are, think that you're the greatest thing since sliced bread, my goodness, you're doing such a great service for our industry. You know what I mean? You're doing such a great service. But if you're closing 300 deals a year and then your client thinks that you were treated just like a number, you're not doing a service for our industry, you know? And and I don't think everyone has to give give back to the industry. I don't think that's a prerequisite. I believe that. I think I need to give back to the industry because it's provided me an amazing life. So, yeah. Michael, uh, in getting to know you, um, I've kind of learned what makes you happy. I mean, you genuinely get joy and fulfillment from helping people. And, and when it comes down to it, the, the formula for success in our industry really comes down to a collection of authentic individual relationships. Yeah. So let's say that you have a brand new agent that you is going to come on your team because you don't do a lot of lead generation. It sounds like the bulk of your uh, business is built upon referral, on yep. relationships, on repeat Absolutely. clients. Um, how do you build and maintain a relationship? For, for someone like you, it becomes natural because you're, you're you, but I'm sure you had to work on it at some point. So if, if you were to teach someone on how you build that trust and maintain it over years, past the transaction, what, what do you do? What are the pillars of that? <sighs> Yeah, I, that's a good point. I don't think I've ever really broken it down to what are the elements of a relationship. I just think, you know, when you've got a good one, I think anytime a relationship is really under the guise of what can you do for me, then that's when that relationship's on rocky, rocky ground. If, right. and, and I think if there's one good thing that has come out of social media, <laughs> it's our BS reader. You know, our BS radar is off the chart. 
I think if you come from a, a genuine place of when you check in with past clients to like, hey, how are you doing? Here's an update on what you are, you know, how are the kids? And you really are generally interested in their kids and right. generally giving them an update on something that's changed in the industry, opposed to an excuse to call them so they can help you grow your business. Right. I, I think people just absolutely sense that. And the other thing, nice thing about social media or just in our lives, we know a lot of triggers about our, about our, about our clients. If you just go, if you never post on social media, you'll be happy. But if you go online and you say your past client's son just graduated college and he was a valedictorian, this, that's that little, you know, stop, open up your phone, send a bomb bomb. Hey, Tom and Mary, I just saw that Eric graduated university. You guys must be so proud. I remember when he was like seven years old, when you guys bought your first home and Congratulations. That's that's a great deal. Please pass that on to Eric. That's all you have to do. Right. I'm so glad you broke it down to that simplicity. Um, we study relationships a lot with with Realvolve and uh, really try and exhibit what their database of relationships is worth. You know, all relationships go from a phase of when you first meet of awareness, no, like trust. Yeah. So you brought up such an important point because once you're in a transaction and you close a transaction, help someone buy and sell a home, they trust you. Mm -hmm. But then that relationship drops off because the agent goes back to chase more leads. But all they have to do is call and ask how they're doing. We have trust, but yeah. just keep it. It's so simple. It's so simple. It's like getting a car up to 100 kilometers an hour. Once it's cruising, I, I'm American. We don't know. What okay. Is. 60 <laughs> miles an hour. Once you get up 60 miles an hour on a flat highway, it's not using the same fuel as it took to get up to speed. I mean, right. it's yeah. really cruising. I mean, a hybrid car is not as efficient on the highway as a gas car, but in town, when it's stop and go traffic, that's when a hybrid really, you know, lift, it does the heavy lifting. The thing about it is, I just got a call in from a client. Sorry about that. Okay. I don't know. I don't know where you went. We, we didn't hear it. That's okay. Okay. I think I'll get you back. There you are. You're back. Um, you're right. Earning trust is so it's difficult. It's like earning. It's like earning trust or earning respect from someone. It's difficult. But once you have it, maintaining it is the easy part, especially from a past client who you've de demonstrated your abilities to successfully do what you said you were going to do. By definition, a past client means you did your job, right? Right. You exactly. did your job. Right. And now you've demonstrated to somebody that you were successful for, that you did your job to, who has coworkers and friends and children and relatives right, right maintaining that trust is so simple why would you want to go back and take a perfect stranger and try to get through all that process to walk away again and this is where we have it made in the shade in north america compared to a, a lot of the rest of the industry around the world where we represent the client our product and I hate to say that word, but our product is the client. Right. When you are only the listing agent and you don't represent the buyer in Europe and Australia, around the world, your product is the home. And the moment you successfully help Tom and Mary sell their home and they're off to buy another home, you say, bye, Tom and Mary. Good luck. You're going to go find right. a new agent. You're going to deal, do a deal without me. And therefore, that relationship isn't maintained. Right. But if you in North America know that even a client that's not going to sell for 15 years is a raving fan of yours, and that's a huge point, create raving fans, they know people that they care about who had a good experience with you. Maintaining a relationship is so much easier than creating a relationship. Look at, look at us as older men. If there's one thing older men have a problem with, Dave, it's finding new buddies to hang out with. Right. But the, the friends you were with in college that you, you know, that they're, that's easy to maintain that relationship because you have history, but it's hard to go out as a 50 year old and meet a new buddy and become best buddies and play poker together. It's, di it's difficult. Right. Right. 
Yep. Yep. But once you have that relationship, maintaining it is so easy. Yep. I, and I wish that everyone knew this secret and, and the truth about our industry, which um, really pushes leads a lot. And we do the same. You know, you need that balance. We do that with Firepoint. But if you have an authentic relationship with three to 500 people who know, like, and trust you as a real estate professional, you'll do 30 to 50 transactions a year from that group like clockwork. And, and here's the magic about that, Dave. So we have these client gatherings, you know, we'll have a client party or whatnot. And Jordan, Trish and I try to find three minutes to sit back at these events and, and, and just take in our client base, you know, like really intentionally stand back and just look at them talking to each other and laughing and eating and, you know, and they all look like each other. And I don't mean physically look like each other. I mean, they're the same type of human being. And one of the great things about those people that if you have a database sending you new business, they're sending them, they're usually sending you people like them. Their friends are like them. They have the same right. priorities. They have the same values. They have the same, all that sort of thing. They have the same structure. And, and, and so when you get a new lead, you don't know if they're high maintenance or low, you know what I mean? You don't know who they are, but when your friend recommends their best buddy, man, that's so much fun to do work with people that are, are mere images of the people you like doing business with. And, and that's really rewarding because yep. that makes your job better. And one of the great things about where we are with media now, if you don't like my personality, we hug our clients, we hug our clients, all the time, and especially at the end of the process. If you don't want to be hugged, you better not work with us. And we're okay with that happening because I, I want to have people that are huggy people. That's the type of client I want to work with. And that's okay that if you go, Michael's not for me, great, because it's Newton's law of you know, uh, every action, there's an equal opposite reaction. If you demonstrate publicly who you are, and that alienates a certain amount of the marketplace, that only means you're pulling a certain amount of the marketplace towards you. And I think as agents, we try to be this vanilla. We try to be kind of interesting to everybody, opposed to super interesting to some people, not everyone, but some people. And that's all we need, like you say. 400 past clients. We go through our database at Realvolve and we look right now at like 627 A's that are trust, you know, A's and trust. And we just go, that's amazing. Like that's right. our business. Yep. Um, there's a lot of noise in our industry. Agents mm -hmm. get distracted. Uh, there is this never ending parade of new tech, AI, um, whatever it is. Yeah. Have we reached peak tech to be able to accomplish our goals? I, I think agents are firmly planted in the transaction, at least for a, a decade or two. We, we are essential. We, we help build communities. So does the tech matter? I know you're a Revolve uh, yeah. you know, customer, but how do agents turn off that distraction from new this, new that, you know, there's a squirrel. I think tech is extremely important in our business, in our industry. I think it is so important to have an amazing tech stack that works for you, but primarily reduces friction for your consumer. That's where all tech should be, reduction of friction for my client. If it reduces friction for my client and reduces friction for me, even better. If it's, you know, if it's zero, some game for me, but reduces for them, great. And if even if it creates a little friction with inside the team, but reduces friction for the consumer, I'm all for that. The big tech switches. In, in 1995, agents in my office quit when we got a fax machine because it was such an enormous change when there wasn't change prior. So it, anytime we have a long uh, uh, period of no change, any change that comes along gets magnified. It seems so much bigger than it actually is. The adoption of tech that we've seen in the last 10, 15 years has been absolutely crucial to the success of a real estate agent. However, I think we're at a point now 
where if you're constantly looking for that silver bullet to come along, that's going to radically change your industry, it already exists right now. Now, I'm not saying that's not going to change in the future. I'm not one of these people. Every change that's ever happened in our industry is already done. I'm not that way. But the tools that we require to be successful now are plenty, they're good, and they're available for us. And so video, which I'm a big believer in, isn't a fad or a trend because it's been around since 1900. It's just accessible to us for the first time, right? And so when it comes to great CRM, video, paperless, all these things, they're here now. I believe any new tech that comes along will be an iteration or an adjustment on something that already exists. I think our next big leap in our industry will be mass adoption of VR, AR. That's probably where the next one is. But, you know, TikTok is the biggest social media platform to come along in the last 10 years. And it is an iteration of Vine. Like it's not a new invention. It's just a twist on. And I think that's what we'll get now. We'll get twists on certain things. We'll get add-ons right. to our CRM. We'll get, you know, YouTube will will introduce YouTube shorts, but it's still YouTube. Um, right. I just really think we're there. We're now. So I think we want magical leads to come along that will convert in 15 minutes. I think we want magical tech to come along that will make my. No, there's no secret. There's no magic weight loss. You know, you got to put in the work. There's no get rich quick scheme that works. There's there's none of this that works. It's it's about doing the work that's important to you to to get you to where your definition of success is. But I think all the tech we need out there is finally here. Um, we're still waiting for a lot of the industry to catch up. Right. Uh, but yeah, I think I think we have it in front of us. And so start implementing, start really using the tech that you have. I mean, you know, you really dig into it. Make sure it's, you know, spend the time onboarding the tech and, and then have it work for you in a really meaningful way. That's why I think we are with tech. Michael. Thank you. You're one of my favorite human beings. Thank you for sharing the wisdom with, with everyone. Um, where can people learn more about you and just have a, a chance to get to know you? Yeah. I mean, I'm pretty easy to find. I'm I, my, my mode of communication generally is Facebook messenger. You can find me there pretty easy. Um, we've got a launched a great podcast, uh, Dave, as you know, um, about uh, three or four months ago called the coffee uh, real estate coffee house where we sit down just like this, but I'm on the opposite side. And I just talk to really great humans about the industry. And there's always just that one or two little nuggets that appear. And that's all you need in your business to make, to make big changes is these little mind shifts here, a little tactic here. Um, and, and so that's what we try to do. So yeah, if anyone wants to reach out and say hi, I, I love talking real estate. Wonderful. Thank you again, sir. 